FAIC. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome today. I have a few slides as usual. You will note the new branding for the uh, ARC and FAIC. Um, and that's how we're going to look. And uh, if, if you have, um, uh, you can, we have a whole lot of, down, of, of uh, handouts today. You can download them from the, the uh, handouts uh, materials down below the chat box. And also, um, if you have any questions, I'll collect them. So put them in the chat box. I'll make sure they get answered at the end. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and I, if you want to keep informed with what's going on with connecting to collections care, um, you can <clears throat> excuse me join the C2C announcements list, and um, or you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. The announce list has maybe one or two messages a month at most, and um, that's a really good way to keep track of what we're doing. If you have questions concerning the care of your collections, you can join the Connecting to Collections Care community. And uh, the instructions of how to do that are <clears throat> on our website. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. And if you have suggestions or problems, you feel free to contact me anytime. This is my email address. Um, we have coming up in a few weeks a uh, webinar on planning for national, uh, natural disasters in botanical collections. And that could mean a historic garden. It could mean the iconic tree outside your museum. It could mean your botanical garden. It's any place where you have live plants that you need to take care of. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, the end of March uh, and on into June, we have uh, a course, Planning Your Reorg Project. Reorg is a, a program that was started by, by ECRON. This is being co-hosted with the Canadian Conservation Institute. It's the first time they've taught this program in the US. It's a fabulous program for uh, working on storage in small collections. And now I'm going to turn this over to Anne uh, Young, who's our speaker today, and take it away. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Mike, for keeping us all going technologically. Um, as Susan noted, my name is Anne Young. I'm the Minister of Research Sections at the Indian Museum of Art at Museum. You're listening here. I have this plan. I am not your lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. Nothing in today's webinar is intended to be specific legal advice. And for any specific legal advice, please consult with your legal counsel. So I'm going to write things here. Uh, feel free to post any questions that you might have in the general chat area and as little that we can um, at the end of the so Before we delve into like a copyright, it's important to know that copyright is but one aspect of the property, law, or IP. And collections may intersect with for all of these different types of IP, but copyright by far is a form of IP that cultural collections will intersect with at the absolute most. So what is copyright? And I will sit here uh, for those of you who are joining us from outside of the space on stage website. Focusing today's talk around top law in the United States, so while some of the practices, some of the uh, nuances of copyright law will overlap from uh, country to country, that it is very important to note that uh, you will also have uh, variances between the countries, and always consult your own own district and country. So in the United States, copyright is a form of legal protection provided by the laws of the United States under Title 17 of the U.S. Code. 
to protect original works of authorship. And while the copyright code specifically says authorship, this could be used to refer to an author, a creator, an artist, anyone who is specifically speaking and creating something. And it is important that it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And this protection is available to both published and unpublished works. Copyrightable works can include intellectual properties such as websites, computer code, software, databases, literary works, music, lyrics, dramatic works, paintings, graphic and sculptural works, motion pictures, any number of things. Just as important as what is copyrightable is what is not copyrightable. These would be ideas, facts, and in the United States, federal government works. In other countries, you will have cases where federal works are still eligible for copyright. Uh, and in individual states, state government works may still be eligible for copyright. So some examples of things not copyright will be the order in your phone book, which is essentially just a listing of facts of names, contact information. And in most jurisdictions, copyright arises upon fixation once something's created and does not need to be registered. So for example, the lovely drawing of the Fez pigeon that you see here, done by my oldest son when he was five, has copyright. It's his original unique expression we could register this with the U.S. Copyright Office if we wanted to, uh, but that registration is not a requirement of copyright protection. But that copyright in this work created even by a five-year-old is automatic upon creation. Now copyright is a set of rights, and these are granted to the author or creator of the original work or to their assignee, so perhaps to an estate, another family member. And it's for a limited time period in exchange for the eventual public disclosure of their work, so when that work moves into the public domain. Copyright owners can license, permanently transfer, or assign any and all of their rights to others. And the copyright owners have the exclusive statutory right to exercise control over copyright and other exploitation of the works for a specific amount of time. And again, once that period of time has passed, then the work enters the public domain. The copyright term duration is what details when works are under copyright or when they have moved into the public domain. Copyright does not last indefinitely, thank goodness but applies just to that specific time. And once that term has expired and the work has moved into the public domain, it is free to be used, built upon, remixed upon by the public without having to seek any further permissions. I will note that these statements here, these are very broad statements. And to always remember that there are always going to be some exceptions to these. But broadly, you can look to works in the United States created before 1923 to be in the public domain. After 20, 1923, the works may or may not be in the public domain, depending on compliance with various registration and renewal and publication requirements of the copyright code at different times. Further to looking at the copyright duration, you have to look at publication and registration and where these registrations and re-registrations were required by the copyright law. If the work was never published and the author died prior to 1949, the term duration has likely expired and the work is in the public domain. For unidentifiable authors, you're going to look to works created before 1893. In the United States, the copyright term broadly for an individual author, creator, or artist lasts for the life of that individual plus 70 years. 
or in the case of corporate authors, which is an institution that you would work for, for 195 years. And to further add another layer onto this, 120 years from the date of creation, if the work is anonymous or where the death date of the creator is unknown. A few additional things to consider when you're looking into the copyright term duration. Look at the type of work. Is it architectural? Is it a painting? Is it a book? Was it published or not? Created by an individual or a corporation in the country of origination. It is important to note that while you have to look at that country of origination, uh, where there might be different copyright terms and where that per the creator lived and died, if you're using the work in the United States and potentially looking at either licensing or fair use of a work, that if something would proceed into a type of a lawsuit or other litigation in the United States, most likely U.S. law would apply, and that's what you want to focus on. Now we'll turn our attention a little bit and look at our dear friend, the public domain. So the public domain will include works that are no longer covered by copyright, where copyright has been forfeited, or works that just never could have been copyrighted to begin with, such as federal government works. You can also look at works in the public domain, maybe those that will have been dedicated by the creator to the public domain, such as through the use of the CC0 or public domain dedication within Creative Commons licensing. And I can't talk about the public domain without noting my favorite holiday of the year. Some of you may know it as New Year's Day, but January 1st is lovingly Public Domain Day. For the first day of each calendar year, the new group of works with copyright expiring moves into the public domain and are freely available for anyone to use them for anything. Reiteration that no copyright to federal government works in the United States, and those are in the public domain. And an issue that is eminently important for many cultural institutions today is looking at this concept of the slavish copy. So many of us with our collections, creating photographs and digital surrogates of the works in our collections. And these things are 2D works originally, some are three-dimensional. Under US copyright law, and based upon the case of Bridgman versus Corral in 1999, in the United States, it has been deemed, at least based within the Second Circuit Court ruling, accurate two-dimensional reproductions of original works do not receive a new copyright. So this means that not claiming a copyright to the photograph of a painting in our collection for these two-dimensional works and for those digital surrogates. There may still be the opportunity that a accurate reproduction of an originally three-dimensional work might have its own copyright. But by and large, accurate 2D reproductions are deemed to be a slavish copy by the court, that there is not enough originality and creativity to warrant a new copyright. Few of you may have heard of this, the Copyright Term Extension Act from 1998, which meant that for the last 20 years in the United States, we did not have any works entering into the public domain. This was the act that extended the copyright term of life of the creator to life plus 70 years instead of being life plus 50 years. This act also retroactively applied to works that should have entered the public domain, but were pulled back under copyright. Thankfully, as of January 1st of this year, the United States once again is among the countries in this, the world with works annually entering into the public domain. Hurrah. And I just want to point out the DMCA as well, quickly. So this is a liability exemption for internet service providers in the cases of user infringement. So you'll see this particularly with cases of where 
uh, services, YouTube, Facebook, uh, our social media platforms that we intersect with, um, and other service providers will be able to utilize uh, DMCA around um, allegations of copyright infringement and being uh, applicable to, to them. So institutions may see applicability of DMCA as well. Uh, with looking at placing images of our collections online, contributing to resources um, potentially such as uh, DPLA or Art Store, and looking at how these different service providers aggregate content. Um, so just one to be aware of. I'm not going to delve too deeply into that today. Next, I want to turn and talk a little bit about Orphan Works. So what is an Orphan Works? An orphan work is a copyrighted work, but it's where its creator or the rights holder is either unknown, or it could be where you know who created the work, but you can't locate them. You can't locate their descendants or an estate and have no way to actually contact anyone for licensing. Equally important is what is not an orphan work. Copyrighted works for which rights Rights holders are known, but ownership is disputed, and works in the public domain. There's a number of ways that works can become orphaned. And this is often where we end up finding that the creator or author of the work or their subsequent estate or rights holder and the work themselves become separated. This can happen where descendants of a artist don't even realize that copyright has transferred to them uh, through lines of descendancy. Could be from a creator using a nom de plume and not being able to track them back to the creator themselves. Changes in record keeping and changes in corporate ownership where uh, different corporations will be bought out by someone else and records of intellectual property may or may not transfer with the sale of the company itself, and the works can thereby become orphaned. It is important to note that just because a work becomes an orphan, that doesn't change its legal copyright status, and the term of protection remains unchanged. Unlike property interests, copyright and other intellectual property rights cannot be lost, mislaid, or abandoned. And just because a work is orphaned, it does not immediately become part of the public domain. Copyright does not vest in another person if the creator is unknown and cannot be found. So if somebody comes out of the woodwork, there needs to be a lot of backtracking determination to find out if they truly are a potential rights holder of an orphan work. Next, I'm going to turn to talking about some exceptions and exemptions within U.S. copyright law. I'm going to talk about a few of these across different areas and their applicability to museums, libraries, galleries, and archives. First, for sale, the public display exception. This is really what comes down to that this is what allows museums and galleries and libraries and all of our cultural institutions to be able to actually exhibit and display works in our collections without having to seek a copyright permission or license every time we want to put those works on display. Can we imagine the headaches, aside from loan agreements, if we had to also seek those permissions for just uses of our own collections on a regular basis? The classroom use exemption. This is really comes back to the idea of teaching and with using our collections on a daily basis and how those copies and uses are put to, into place. To parallel with that, this as well, looking at the TEACH Act. And this is allows for distance education, MOOCs, and any utilization of those works and how copyrighted works can be utilized within them. I'm going to spend a few slides here to actually talk about some of the various library exceptions under Section 108 of the U.S. Copyright Code. And a big part of why I want to actually focus on Section 108 
is that this is actually an area that the U.S. Copyright Office has been looking at very closely over the last couple of years and has been pending changes to Section 108 to formally add museums under this exception. So those of you coming from museums, stay tuned. Hopefully, some of these exceptions in Section 108 will be expanded to not just include activities of libraries and archives, but to also include museums. So this is something that for currently for libraries and archives, you must be open to the public and are available to be researched. And where this does not apply currently to museums is that although a museum may have a library and or an archive within their institution, the museum does not fall under Section 108 just for the sake that it happens to have a library and an archive, only specifically that would the library and the archive be covered by Section 108. So many works currently do not qualify. But Section 108, as it currently stands for libraries and archives, is a wonderful resource and is what allows libraries and archives to create, to distribute multiple copies, to lend, uh, to have reproduction equipment available, copyright machines available for patrons to utilize, as where you'll always see the notice by any of the copy machines in a library as well. It allows libraries to share copies across libraries, so things like your interlibrary loan. And in such aggregated quantities that Libraries are not using ILL as a substitute for actually purchasing the work themselves for their own collection or for subscribing to a journal themselves. The ability under Section 108 for libraries to create preservation, security, or replacement copies currently limited to three copies for those purposes would be immensely helpful to those in the museum world, particularly for those of us starting to deal more and more with time-based media materials and born other born digital materials that currently we have no exception in the copyright law that allows us to create copies of these works for the purposes of preservation or security or replacement. That right now, the only way that a museum is able to create a copy for one of those purposes is through some sort of a contract with that copyright holder to begin with. Next, we'll turn our attention to talking about fair use, one of the exceptions that many of you are more familiar with in the copyright code. The fair use of a copyrighted work including such use by reproduction in copies or phono records or by any other means specified by that section for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research, and this is the important part, is not an infringement of copyright. It says so right there in the code. Yet despite it saying right there in the code that it is not an infringement, when do we use it? How can we use it? So looking at things of where we can have commentary, parody, limited educational uses, non-commercial. There may be even be cases where something is more considered more of a commercial use, but could still potentially also be a fair use. Determining fair use is broadly looked at under what is known as the four-factor test. So you look at the purpose and character of the use, the original nature of the copyrighted use, the amount and substantiality of the work used, and the effect of the use upon the work. It is important to note that while there are these four factors that courts will look to in fair use cases, that in order to pass a fair use, you do not have to meet all four factors. You don't even have to meet three out of the four. It is how each is weighed and looked in there, assessed individually, and then weighed together to make a fair use determination. And more recently, Sir Judge Laval's introduced what is now almost considered a fifth factor, is 
the transformative use, or as my seven-year-old likes to call it, the transformer use. I think I almost like the idea of that we can take something and transformer it better. But this concept of transformative is that you have taken something and you've added to it, that there's something new and value added, and that you haven't used more than was necessary of the original work to achieve that case. Where this really comes out is in the case of Rogers v. Coons. So in this case, and you see in the image here, that Jeff Coons created a sculpture based on this photograph that he's seen by Rogers. And Coons basically took the entire photograph to create his sculpture. And of course, this was not this was not a fair use. This was, he didn't transform it enough, he didn't change it enough, that he really took almost verbatim that even just changing it from being a two-dimensional photograph to a three-dimensional sculpture, that wasn't enough. It didn't transform it enough. Transformative use comes in a lot when you start looking at cases of appropriation art. Here you have examples from Cario B. Prince, the cases in 2011 and 2013. Did Prince transform these enough to make them different? Some of them, yes. <laughs> Some of them, no. It was a interesting case where not all of the work in the case were deemed to be a fair use. And I believe memory serves, I believe it was five, were remanded and not considered a fair use. An additional point for the GLAM sector and any cultural institution to look to from these cases was the potential liability of display and distribution that the gallery displaying Prince's work was also sued for copyright infringement by Carrie U in this case. So something for museums to think about that when we are looking at displaying works by appropriation artists, what type of risk and liability are we also potentially taking on by displaying those works? Stepping a little outside of copyright specifically, we we'll talk briefly about privacy and publicity and where these intersect with uses of copyrighted material. So the right of privacy, and some of you may be more familiar with this, especially recently with uh, all of the recent news in the last year coming out of the EU with the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR, that looking at how data and the right to privacy is protected and not just looking at someone's likeness or their voice but also extending to data. The simplest way to think of the right of privacy is quite simply the right to be left alone. And this is a phrase that was coined by then attorney Samuel Warren and eventually Justice Brandeis in, 18, in an 1890 Harvard Law Review. And the right to privacy is summed up in four points. An unreasonable intrusion on personal solitude. Public disclosure of true but embarrassing private facts. False light. Or the appropriation of someone's name and likeness. Coinciding with the right of privacy is the right of publicity. And this right of publicity is the right to control the commercial exploitation of a person's name, likeness, or voice. In the United States, the right of publicity is governed by state law. It is not a federal law. And depending on the state, the right of publicity may or may not extend beyond the person's death. So while right of privacy will end with a person's death for sure, the right of publicity, particularly with a public figure, may extend beyond their life. So VARA, the Visual Artists' Rights Act. 
in the United States. VARA is the closest that we get to the European and other countries' concepts of moral rights, but it is not exactly moral rights to the same concept and to the same degree that you see in the EU and in the UK. And so VARA grants artists the right to claim authorship of their work. They can also prevent the use of their name in the event of a distortion or mutilation of a work, uh, and which also means that the artist has the right, not only can they claim authorship, but you will see artists now recently disavowing their work and now saying, nope, that is no longer my work. Most recently, this actually came out uh, in a Richard Prince, uh, he, he comes up a lot in, in the copyright cases, um, but Richard Prince recently disavowed a photograph from his Instagram series that was a photograph of Ivanka Trump that Ivanka Trump owns, and she was talking about owning this photograph. And Richard Prince came out and said that it is actually not a Richard Prince photograph, despite her having bought it from his gallery representation. And so a case where the artist has come in and now is disavowing that they created that work to begin with. VAR also prevents intentional distortion, mutilation, or modification of the artist's work, and also prevents a destruction of that work. So before VARA, or essentially pre-1990, the owners, not the artists, had control of the works, which means that in 1989, Richard Serra had no recourse available to him when Tilted Art was cut into three pieces and dismantled. After VARA, or post-1990, now the artists, not the owners, have complete control of their works. Which means that in 2017, when Fearless Girl was placed to face the charging bull, that claims of intent and changing the message that it had somehow mutilated his work or hurt his reputation, that he could bring that suit against Kristen Bisball. And this is a work that continues to face litigation, that recently Bisball now has been had legal action brought against her, of all things, by the company that originally commissioned Fearless Girl from her. And this, I will just point out as a word of caution to always look at your contracts and licenses and look at how the rights and ownership are outlined. But this was a case where, although this ball created the work, Hard to not delve completely into any of the contracts and what is available about the case, but she's been selling reproductions and various versions of the work. And the company is saying that she doesn't hold the intellectual property to it, that they hold the rights to that, and she can't be creating these reproductions of her own work. Again, it goes back to an interpretation and being really careful of what your contract language actually says. Now I'm going to put you all on the spot a little bit for a little bit of a quiz and see how much you've been paying attention. For a work to be copyrightable, it has multiple requirements, including meets the originality requirements, it sticks to intangible medium, is a source of consumer confusion, and that its subject matter is copyrightable. The answer may be more than one. Excuse me. Okay. Most of you did very well. Excellent job. So for work to be copyrighted, it has to meet A, B, and D. 
consumer confusion is something that actually comes in under trademark law, a different form of intellectual property. Number two, what are the exclusive rights of the copyright owner? To distribute the work in copies to the public, to display the work publicly, prepare derivative works, reproduce the work in copies, perform the work publicly, or all of the above. Well done, all of the above. Seventeen USC Section 107 states that for the purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship or research is not an infringement of copyright. I don't even need to read through these. You guys got that one. Well done. Fair use. That's right. Last quiz question right here for you. Does the United States have a statute version of Europe's moral rights laws? Remember the disclaimer that I gave at the beginning when I first started talking about VARA. Yep, it's a little bit of a trick question. So while the Visual Artist Rights Act does provide some elements of moral rights protection to artists in the United States, it is not exactly a statutory version of Europe's moral right laws. It's close, but it does not actually exist as a full moral rights provision. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm going to delve a little bit into a little bit more practical application of some of the copyright statute and how we put this into practical application in dealing with copyright on a daily basis, working in cultural institutions. So first, determining the right status. And for better or for worse, because of all of the things that we talked about and things with like the, the term extension act and how copyright law has changed and the terms have extended, there are so many different exemptions and ways in how long copyright can last. But we are all very lucky because a wonderful man named Peter Hurdle annually updates his copyright term in the public domain in the United States chart at Cornell. See a little bit here. Available online through Cornell's Copyright Information Center. Their entire website is a wonderful resource. I would highly recommend spending some time there and looking at what they have. But in particular, look at the copyright term in the public domain in the United States chart. This chart will take you through a variety of different types of works. So works never published, never registered, first published in the United States, architectural works, it really covers the gambit of the different types of works, audiovisual works, music, uh, films. It, it really has, so you can start breaking down and looking through all of these, looking at, was it created 1923 after 1923? Where does it fall with the 120 year mark for corporate authorship? And help walk through that chart. Now I'm going to go through what are some really, really super broad strokes that most of us working in cultural institutions, we do not have the luxury of having the staff or the time to go through and do copyright determination and analysis on a step, on an item level basis and take each individual work step by step through these copyright determinations. I'm gonna hit a few really broad strokes here a lot of the uh, broad determinations and some of the steps that I'm going to be going through in the coming slides are uh, excerpts from Rights and Reproduction, the Handbook for Cultural Institutions, uh, now available through Roman and Littlefield in its uh, second edition. A little side plug for you there. But 
essentially you want to look at that for these broad determinations, you want to first be looking at your works and that assume all works by a single creator are either unpublished or unregistered. Second, look at works by living creators or creators who died within the past 70 years will be under copyright for the life of that creator plus 70 years. Just a reminder, these determinations are based on US copyright law, so again, look to the copyright uh, term for your specific country where it might be life plus 50 years or for life plus 70. Three, look at works by anonymous creators or in cases where the creator's death date is unknown, works made for hire, and the, your corporate works, that those works will be under copyright for 120 years from the date of their creation. And of course, remember, all of the various exceptions that we talked about earlier, and particularly that US government federal works do not receive that copyright protection. You want to also be looking at making these determinations, specifically looking at that first time that a work was published. Making that determination can be a lot of additional research. You may or may not have the luxury of being able to find a specific registration status or publication status. But if you're able to, you can do some of that research through the US Copyright Office um, in person. Um, and they're working on making more of that searchable and available online as well. The next step is identifying the copyright holder. And this could be in a number of places. So you want to be able to sit and start looking at works and looking at the actual work itself. So look at your painting, look at the book. Is there a copyright notice on it? Do some background research on the creator. Check your institutional records. Look through historical files that your registrar might have. Look through curatorial records. Look through purchase records. Um, look through records and press, even from your development office, libraries, your archival records um, that might have some guidance to who holds that copyright. You want to look at aggregate databases, so things such as uh, the Artist Rights Society or the watch file out of the Harry Ransom Center. Mind the web. A number of times, and particularly with more active artists and authors working today, many will have a website. And you can often find contact information there. Confer with your colleagues. Listservs are an invaluable way to be able to track down copyright information. And evaluate priorities. Are you going to go step by step and assess every work in a collection? Or is identifying a rights holder going to be based on a specific use? Is it going to be in preparation for a specific exhibition or a publication that's upcoming versus a start it the first succession number and work your way all the way through. In addition to considering just the copyright and the IP within the work, you also have to start thinking about that there could be other intellectual property considerations aside from just the copyright when you're looking for a rights holder. You could be looking for the copyright holder. You may also be looking at potentially somebody holding trademark rights the privacy and publicity that we talked about, looking at the work as public domain or not, if you're going to be looking to license something or if you're going to potentially be making a fair use analysis. And importantly, you want to also look at, is this a work that potentially has underlying rights? And when we talk about underlying rights, this will be something where perhaps it's, say, an Alfred Stieglitz photograph. Most of Alfred Stieglitz photographs are now in the public domain. But it's an Alfred Stieglitz photograph of Georgia O'Keeffe with one of her artworks. Do you rely on public domain for the entirety of the photograph? 
Or do you, how do you also consider the copyright to Georgie O'Keeffe's painting that appears within that photograph? You could have multiple layers in, that have to be licensed. In addition then to not only having her artwork and the copyright as an underlying right, you may also have her underlying right of publicity with her likeness reproduced in that photograph as well. So just remembering that there could be multiple layers to consider when licensing or doing a fair use analysis. There's also a number of uh, referred to as other considerations when making these rights determinations that these are not strictly copyright or intellectual property considerations, but may also need to be taken into consideration when reviewing a rights holder and if licensing or fair use will be considered. So we can use it a work by an indigenous people, representations of obscenity or violence or otherwise sensitive materials, perhaps you have creator restrictions or donor restrictions that perhaps could guide how something is utilized or not. Are there other security concerns or other interactions and in how something is used that you want to be aware of when looking at licensing or not? And of course, any of those contractual restrictions and some of which we've talked about before. Helping to guide us a little bit in this direction is something called Right Statements. Rightstatements.org is a joint product that came out of the DPLA in Europeana. And this is something that was formed that after the Digital Public Library of America launched and working with their partners with Europeana, that really starting to look at it and go, huh, so they started looking at all the metadata fields and the content represented in their databases and realized it was the rights field that had the most variations and the most content. And there was no consistency. So rightstatements.org is a project to try to clarify the language that those in cultural institutions utilize to talk about the copyright status of the works in their collections. So they broadly created these three categories of in copyright, no copyright, or other. And within these three categories, there are 12 right statements that can be attached and utilized on individual works. So trying to get it so that in an international context, those in cultural institutions can be utilizing the same type of language for their rights and how they're determining and stating these so that from one country to another, they're able to actually look at what that rights statement is and how they can potentially interpret what that rights statement means to them. This uh, document here created by the Minnesota Digital Library is just an amazing workflow for looking at applying rights statements to works in our collection. Um, I would highly recommend that you look at this. It helps you walk through different documents and uh, collection types that you might have and different works you might have in your collection and walks you through how and where you may be able to apply different statements from rightstatements.org. Um, don't worry about trying to write down the link here. We've got it in the copyright handout for you to, to be able to reference. Um, but that it takes you through looking at, you know, for a government document, is it a federal government document, something created by the U.S. federal government? Is it created by a state government or a local government? And where those delineations and rights may change. Um, so I realize you probably can't read it at all on the screen here, but I highly encourage that you look at this um, and check it out later on your own time. So parallel to the right statements are going to be licenses. And with licenses, hopefully you will have been lucky enough that you've gone through, you've been able to do a copyright analysis, make a rights determination, you've been able to track down a copyright holder and potentially be looking at licensing, or you might be having to look at that fair use analysis. Um, but if you are looking at a potential licensing situation, that you might be in an opportunity to be able to send out a non-exclusive license. 
And so a non-exclusive license can be something that is unbelievably invaluable that you can send out to the rights holder of a work or works in your collection by them that will just not necessarily transfer their rights to your institution, but will grant you a non-exclusive use for a predetermined list of uses. Um, examples shown here. Um, for for the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields, we broadly have our non-exclusive licenses. It includes almost any use with the exception of creating retail products, which would be negotiated separately. Uh, and this can really save a lot of time down the line, that if you're able to get a non-exclusive license return, that you're able to potentially look at utilizing works by this person without having to go back to them time and time and again. You may also find some of these licenses among commission contracts and where you're going to outline and be noting what license is given to the institution versus what rights the artist retains in the work that's created. So I'm going to go through the next handful of slides pretty quickly. Um, just you can always go back to these later. I know that Susan will um, make all of the slides from today available later. Um, so these are really going to be the, the license elements and the various pieces that you would want to have when you are creating a license, whether it's in a non-exclusive or as part of a overall contract for something else that's being done. But wanting to go through and make sure that all of this information is captured in outline. Because at the end of the day, when you're looking at the contracts and by legal standards, they are going to be looking at the document itself and what is in writing, what is within the four corners of that piece of paper. So for the sake of time, and I know that I see the, the growing list of questions popping up, um, so I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to address those questions. So I'm going to move through these pretty quickly, but you want to have the parties identified, what the material is that you're going to be licensing, um, so whether that's one object in your collection or an entire group of archival material, who owns the materials and who will be, a, is the ownership transferring in those materials or not? And then what rights are, are granted? Are they exclusive? Are they not exclusive? Is it irrevocable? Is it revocable? Um, what those rights include within that bundle of rights that we talked about at the beginning of today's webinar within copyright? Are there any limitations or restrictions on those uses? Um, and outlining as many of these uses up front as you can, that it's always easier to ask once for a lot of things than to have to keep coming back a dozen times adding on to that license. Wanting to look at how it's used, what its territory is, um, how you're going to me measure that use. Are there other elements to consider within it with the medium? Um, you're going to want to look at what that term is. Is it something that's going to be in print? Is it something that's digitally based? Um, are we looking at a defined number of years, a specific print run perhaps, or is it something that's in perpetuity? You want to especially be sure to note, as well as the individual uses, be looking at the credit lines and the copyright notice and how that attribution is seen coming through with any of the uses. Of course, if there's any fees in the exchange of license, you want to make sure that that is stated. This gets into uh, what, uh, what a lot of people would refer to as the legalese of these licenses, but they're very important. So wanting to look at your warranties and representations that the creator warrants, yes, that further to any other information, what they're stating, that yes, they warrant, they hold the rights to this, they are able to actually grant the license that they that you are seeking from them. Any limitations to liability or indemnification that you perhaps could be looking at. And then of course the signatures. And whether that is something that you're looking at physical signatures, uh, on printed documents, electronic signatures, or perhaps even looking through a click to agree documentation. Other forms of licenses that you might end up utilizing with cultural collections uh, might be some Creative Commons licenses. 
And so Creative Commons is really all about that idea of share, remix, reuse, and how works can be identified. Creative Commons licenses are just that. They are a type of a license. It's not a grant of a specific right. It's not a transfer of rights, but it is a license to a work. You might he have been hearing more and more about cultural institutions releasing their images of works in their collections, particularly public domain works, under open access, and perhaps attaching Creative Commons licenses to those, or perhaps they're releasing metadata to their collections under a Creative Commons license. Most often, you're going to see them releasing these items from their collections under one of the first two licenses that you see here. So either that public domain mark, where there's no known copyright, or the CC0 mark, by which it waives all rights and places the work into the public domain. I've seen a little bit of collections using both, most recently with the Met and the Cleveland Museum of Art and their releases of their collections for open access and partnering with Creative Commons for this. That a large reason why I know that the Met went and used CC0 more than they used the public domain mark was that it was essentially saying that because there will always be cases where you might feel pretty strongly that yes, this work is in the public domain, but there might be a region somewhere where that work maybe is not in the public domain or having to do additional research could end up finding that maybe it actually isn't in the public domain. Or perhaps, you know, conversely, that a work that you thought was under copyright might actually be in the public domain because it didn't comply with re-registration that was required at the time when it was created or something. Um, so instead, looking at using that CC0 license, that essentially that then the Met and CMA utilizing that, that they they are saying that they're not claiming any rights to their digital surrogate of the image of that artwork created. So again, going back to that idea of Grisham versus Corel, with no, no new copyright in that slavish reproduction, and that through the use of CC0, they're stating they're not claiming any rights to that image and they are placing it into the public domain to the best of their knowledge. And the last little bit that I am going to review today is actually putting fair use into use. Now remember, fair use is going to come into play when we're potentially looking at scholarship, research, education, commentary, criticism, reporting, and non-commercial uses, for the most part. In determining fair use, we go back to that whole idea of the four factors plus transformativeness and trying to figure this out. And unfortunately, fair use is anything but black and white. It's not an easy trick, tick box to say, cool, we meet one through four, and we've met all of these, so it's a fair use. Instead, it's really a continuum, and each factor has to be weighted and assessed on this spectrum to see, are you favoring more on the edge of being more like fair use, or is it less likely that it could be considered a fair use and you might need to consider a license? Luckily for all of us, we have a lot of wonderful professional organizations that have put out an amazing slew of statements and codes and guidelines to guide those of us working in GLAM institutions with the use of fair use. Many of these are included in the handout material, so I highly recommend that you uh, take, take a look at these. They can really help guide when and how you can potentially utilize fair use and how you can make some of these determinations. I will just put out a word of caution that although you might have times where you think you have a really great opportunity for fair use, sometimes you may still need to look at a license. And sometimes it's about maintaining relationships. So for the Naples Museum of Art, when we, uh, about a year and a half ago, rebranded our overall campus to Newfield. New logo, new name. And we went, you know what? Our designers and our marketing team really love our Sala Wit wall, and they wanted to use a detail of it. 
within our new logo. I'm pretty sure I went and hid under my desk at that point going, oh, the headache and the work this is going to entail. I had some marketing people like, oh, it's the detail. It's going to be for you. It's such great exposure for Soloit. And I'm sitting there going, that's going to be appear on everything. And trying to maintain a good working relationship with the Soloit estate. So we reached out to them to look at licensing this. We got very lucky. Uh, the Soloit Solo Ed Estate was actually thrilled to be part of our rebranding and to be utilized in this manner and actually granted us a license for this. And that for most of it, they actually granted it at no cost to us as well, which was quite shocking. Um, but it was about maintaining that relationship, that sometimes you're going to be seeking permission for cases where you maybe are thinking you might have an opportunity for fair use. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't, but it, you're maintaining that relationship. Another example of this, for us is with our Roy Lichtenstein sculpture, five brush strokes on our large mall at the front of the museum on our campus. And so very strong belief that placing images of works in our collection on our website um, to be able to highlight the works in our collection is a fair use. This was something, this image of five brush strokes on our website, we stand by that, that it's fair use. We did not license anything from the Lichtenstein Foundation. Yet when we put out a new book about new fields and our art and nature collections, and we had images of five brush strokes that would appear inside the book, as you see on the left here, we went, okay, interior reproduction, probably a fair use. However, then when we got some initial design proofs back from our designers, and they wanted to use the Lichtenstein on the cover of the book. That started to change things a little bit. But then at that point, not only was it just tying into the collections and being how it, how it in the context of that, but now as the cover of the book, it starts walking that borderline of maybe being a little more commercial and marketing in its use. So we reached out to the Lichtenstein Foundation for this. And again, similar experience that we had with the Lewis Foundation, they were actually quite thrilled to be featured and be part of this book and be featured on the cover. Um, and in lieu of a licensing fee that we may or may not have had the ability to pay, they actually just asked for a larger number of gratis copies of the publication to be sent to them um, so that they could provide copies to their entire board um, which we were happy to do because shipping them at extra copies of the book was exponentially less expensive than having to pay a large licensing fee. And I will just also point out that sometimes you might have this really great idea and it is so clearly has the potential to be a fair use that it's perhaps something at an institution for an exhibition and it's in gallery, it's contextualizing, it's talking about the works. And this is something that you feel really strongly is potentially a fair use. However, sometimes the individual that you also need to license an image file from happens to also be the copyright holder. So we had that in this case here where this lovely photograph that we wanted to be able to reproduce in an exhibition. And the only way that we could get an image file large enough for our needs of enlarging the photograph to put on a wall and have it enlarged to 9 by 12 feet was from the photographer himself. And so we worked with him very closely, and we did pay a licensing fee to him. But in this case, it was not as much of it being a licensing fee specifically for the copyright, although it was getting the file from the who happened to be also the copyright holder, but this is also sometimes it is an image access fee, that you're paying for access to that really large original image file. So again, just that reminder that fair use is probably not going to cover all possible uses and ethical users have to consider that permissions might be necessary. 
All right, I have one more quiz for you, and then we'll get into some of your questions. What risk does an institution assume if it uses an orphan work? Wow. All right, very good. Potential infringement claim, that's absolutely right. Well done. Hurdle's chart includes which categories for determining copyright status? Architectural work, never published, never registered. Works registered or first published in the United States, sound recordings, works first published in the United States by foreign nationals or U.S. citizens living abroad, or all of the above. Well done, all of the above. When reproducing a core work that includes a work depicted, there may be additional layers of copyright to clear. This is referred to as under copyright, layered rights, underlying rights, or a copyright cluster. Well done again in underlying rights, although I would, there's part of me that really wants to start a petition with the Copyright Office and we can get copyright cluster officially in there somewhere. It feels pretty applicable sometimes. And what are reasons to request a one-time permission for use? The rights holder previously noted a preference to handle each request individually. Project has imminent deadline, needs a fast reply. Fees assessed for each use by a rights holder, rights holder represented by an agency like the Artist Rights Society or ASCAP, or all of the above. Great, all of the above. Because of the Visual Artist Rights Act, attribution is a legal requirement when an institution uses a creator's work. True or false? Oh, looks like I may have finally gotten you guys. Eh, false. So while attribution is something that we all like to be able to provide, and it attribution definitely helps towards a fair use analysis and fair use stance, attribution is actually not legally required by Visual Artists Rights Act. And so with that, I think we'll be able to start getting into questions here in a minute, but I will just say as a few final thoughts that by and large, it's better to sit back, do that analysis when you can. Um, if you have the time and the ability to do it on an individual item basis, that's amazing, but remembering that overall, you're probably going to be looking at some of those broader strokes. Uh, and to really be able to look at that attribution may or may not be something that you consider, um, that you, you may want your collection known, but where you are legally required or not to have it. And remembering to consider not only the intellectual property and copyright issues that you might have with a project, but also those non-intellectual property issues as well. Thank you. I appreciate all of you staying with me today. Okay, I'm going to put up the evaluation link. The evaluations are really important to us, so I do hope that you folks will fill that, this out. And I, I'll read the questions. So Cindy McKay asked for unpublished works. Uh, was it is 1893 for identifiable authors? but 120 years for anonymous work. Why is it 1893? Oh, heavens. 1893, okay, hold on. It is... 1893 at 120 years. <laughs> 
Um, that would be my uh, typo, so apologies. It should actually be 1899. Good catch. Sorry. Okay. All right. I thought I got um, all of those dates and years updated. I, that one must have totally snuck through. So my apologies there. It actually should be 1899 to parallel with that 120 years. So sorry about that. Good okay. Catch. All right. Um, Margot um, Gutstein says, does a museum need to get permission before creating a display facsimile for an, uh, an exhibit? And you probably just covered that, right? Yeah, and for better or for worse, it comes back to a, you know, a little bit of it depends. Um, does your institution believe that potentially is a fair use? Unfortunately, the museum is not covered by that Section 108 that we talked about that libraries and archives are covered by. So for a museum to make a reproduction of that and put a reproduction on display, they likely are going to either look at is it something that they believe is a fair use in order to be able to have that on display, or is it a um, case where they're going to be seeking a permission and a license. And um, OK, I, I will speak up. Um, there is a question, can you please define uh, a government work? And there was a discussion about it, but I'll let you define it too, please. Oh, sure. Um, so I'm specifically speaking in regards um, to US federal government works. These would be works created by employees of the federal government um, in the course of their employment. Um, so it may not be somebody governed by a federal contract, because that likely would be um, something governed by that contract specifically, but looking at federal government workers in the course of their employment, that works that they produce are in the public domain. Um, that same exception that the government works being in the public domain um, is going to be different when you start looking at the US state and local government levels, um, and those are each determined by different state and local laws. So one of one of the examples that people put in was WPA work. And does that qualify or? Correct. So the, the WPA okay. work are largely in the, in the public domain. So that's a great exception. So looking at the Dorothea Lang photograph that I had, that was a work that she actually uh, produced as part of her work in the WPA um, and is in the public domain, yet other work by Dorothea Lang taken around the same time period are still under copyright, and her copyright is actually maintained by the Oakland Museum of California. OK. Um, what would the situation be for something like a ceramic vase created by Newcomb Pottery? Um, is this a corporation? What would? Um, what about when we also know the potter, uh, the decorator, or the potter? Uh, that is a case where you could potentially have multiple rights holders. Um, it, a lot of it was going to be governed by the uh, contracts between the corporation and the artist and, and or designer, um, that it might be a case where the corporation holds all of the rights, but it might be a case where rights are jointly held between the corporation and the designer or artist. Um, I, I've seen it both ways. I've also seen this when you look at um, like fashion photographs. Um, and things where like, that appear in like Vogue magazine or something as well. Um, sometimes those photographers hold the rights to their images, um, but other times it's transferred to the um, governing corporation. So in that example, like Vogue, it probably might be held by Condé Nast, but it might be held by the individual photographer or both. Oh, okay. Um. So Mark Kratzner said, define published. Is an O'Keeffe painting that was not displayed published? 
maybe. Um, published when it <laughs> comes, yeah, I know. Um, there, there's a lot when it starts getting into the legal and with the copyright where the answers are always maybe or it depends. Um, so published when it comes to artwork uh, becomes a much grayer area. Um, it might have been actual display in a gallery or a museum exhibition. It could have been publication in a catalog or an auction catalog. Um, and publication can occur years after creation as well. Um, so it's one of the areas within copyright law that I will say working from personal experience and particularly if you are working in the rights determination and world of in broad stroke, you're not going to get down to that publication of individual works research very often, especially if you're looking at your collection overall and making some of these broad strokes and broad determinations. Where that maybe comes in to be more applicable is if there is something in your collection that is very important that you really want to use, and it's on that fence as to whether it's under copyright or in the public domain, that's where you might be doing that additional research down to the item level, spending some time with the copyright office and doing the really deep level dive to figure out registration, re-registration, first publication, to really try to make this very item level specific copyright determination. I know, uh, for example, the Art Institute of Chicago has been able to place a couple um, drawings that they have by Picasso into the public domain because they were able on these two very specific drawings to do the item level research all the way down to find I think in one, one of them it was registered but never re-registered, so it fell into the public domain. One was never published, and something else, I don't remember all the nuances. But that research on two works took their IP counsel over a year. Most of us don't have a year to spend researching just two individual works. So while publication is important, when you're having to do that really intense, deep level research, I don't think most of us are going to get to that level. Okay, so um, we have about nine minutes, and I will tell people that the questions that don't get answered, I will give to Anne, and I will post her written answers as soon as I get them from her. Um, Absolutely. And, and I call those trailing questions, so uh, we'll, we'll, don't worry, your questions will get answered. Uh, Susan Schlecht says, what about general newspaper articles for use by a museum? I'm assuming that this means articles that that the museum is using. Um, well, that would could go one of two ways. If you're actually talking about displaying the actual newspaper and the actual article, that would be fine. Um, if you're looking at reproductions of it, you might need a license. Again, it might be a fair use depending on how you're utilizing it. Um, but most likely if there's a specific article that you're looking at reproducing, there's probably copyright in that either with to the journalist or the corporate owner of that newspaper. OK. Asita Albert says, what is the legality regarding review copies donated by, uh, to the library? Because there wasn't a first sale, I don't feel comfortable adding to our collection and return it to the donor. What's the best way to communicate this to potential donors and coworkers uh, who might not agree or understand? I, is that a copyright question? I'm, eh, I'm not sure if that's actually specifically a copyright question or more of a, a procedure question. Donative question in, who, in an ownership of actual physical materials question. Uh, obviously, my contact information is on the screen, so I'm, I'm happy to try to answer that question, but I think I might need some more information to figure that one out. OK. Um, 
Diana, I, I'm not even going to attempt this. Does, does the museum library archives have the right to charge someone a usage fee publishing a photo in a book, for example, um, if the photo is technically in the public domain? Not just the fee to have the photo scanned, but for the right to use the work. I think that's a really good question. So this is definitely an area in the field of rights and reproductions that is uh, shifting and changing right now, um, that a, a lot more institutions are moving towards more open access and waiving uh, reproduction fees for licensing materials, but may still charge a um, image preparation fee, so that work to have a new photograph taken or a new scan prepared to basically, you know, c cover their staff time and expertise and work uh, to create that new digital surrogate to send. Uh, and this is kind of, it's an evolving area and it really comes back to institutional practice and what your institution wants to do and whether they assess a reproduction fee or not um, for works underlying that are in the public domain. Um, for the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields, we don't charge a reproduction fee for works that are in the public domain. We make those available under open access. Um, but if a work is in the public domain and needs new photography, we are going to assess our image preparation fee because depending on what the work is, how many of our staff members need to get involved, is it something huge that we need our installation crew to actually relocate the work to our photo studio? our photographer and our photo editor's time to prep that file. Um, so okay. Um, the question. How does copyright transfer work when the creator dies if no specific beneficiary is named? Uh, oh, and one more question regarding the definition of a copyrightable work. Where do designed objects like political campaign posters event posters, commemorative uh, coins, and houseware uh, where it's fall. Is a copyright, uh, is copyright an issue for artifacts like this, particularly uh, if the designer is unknown? So that's two questions. Yeah, that was definitely two questions. Um, can you say the first part again? Um, how does copyright transfer work when the creator dies if no specific okay. beneficiary was named? OK, so let me tackle that for part first. <laughs> um, so transfer of copyright will actually follow. So ideally and hopefully, you will be in a case where the creator has created a will, and depending on how prolific they were in life and how successful they were. Perhaps they created a foundation or they have a functioning estate that will then take over their management of their rights. If, however, there is no will or no foundation or something like that that's created to have the rights transferred to after the um, and management of those rights transferred to after the creator has passed away, then it's going to follow um, intestacy laws. Um, it will be, you know, vary by state for that descendancy. Um, so most often, um, that would be then looking first to a spouse or partner. Um, if there's no spouse or partner, then looking to descendants. So children, then grandchildren. And this is where I'm saying, like, there have definitely been times where you might fall down and somebody might be a grandchild or great-grandchild of someone and may or may not realize that they actually manage the rights for this person now. Um, but yeah, so it would follow just your intestacy laws of the particular state where they passed away. OK. Um, let's out answer one more question, then I'll send these, the rest of these to you. Um, let's see. Apologies if you answered this. This is from Kenny Libin. Um, if you answered this earlier, but regarding fair use in terms of a display in a museum, does fair use apply if the museum uses a copy of the original work, i.e., a copy of a photograph, 
rather than putting the original photograph on display as long as the original is in the collection of the museum? Great question. Um, so yes, if you're putting the actual object or photograph on display, then you don't need to be looking at a fair use analysis or exception in the law. Um, if you're creating a reproduction of that to include either as part of like a label copy or a didactic or even a reproduction just for preservation purposes instead of putting the original object on display, um, I would say that most likely you would have a very strong fair use um, stance for that in-gallery exhibition use because it's likely going to have um, more of an educational end goal. It's going to be more non-commercial in its use. It's going to be contextualized with the other works around it. Um, so I think that there's a stronger opportunity for that to potentially be a fair use to them. Um, but again, that's going to be an analysis that has to be done by each institution and based on what level of risk uh, and liability that institution is comfortable with potentially taking on. Okay, I, I think that's the end for today. I will send these questions and get answers to them and I'll make sure that all of your questions get answered. Please fill out the evaluation and um, everything will be posted except maybe the trailing questions in the next few days. So as I said, if um, the ad for this webinar is no longer on the Connecting to Collections Care website, you'll find the webinar, all the handouts, the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and the trailing questions in the 219 archive. So thank you very much.